Hi, and welcome back to Community Conservation, a series that presents projects, ideas, and people surrounding conservation in Oregon. I'm your host, Sarah Armstrong, the Marketing Manager at Oregon Wildlife Foundation. And today we're thinking about the movement of wildlife and what exactly their path looks like in the human habitat that we've created. I have three experts with me here today who independently serve among our state's management departments, but together form a partnership called PAM, Protect Animal Migration. Welcome Lori Turner, wildlife biologist with the US Forest Service, Sarah Gregory, wildlife habitat biologist with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, and Sydney Bowman, wildlife passage coordinator with the Oregon Department of Transportation. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, right off the top, I want to point out that this initiative, Protect Animal Migration, is um, very much a agency collaboration with each of you representing very different but very important departments. Um, I'm just wondering if each of you can briefly explain your role at your department and how this topic affects your work. Lori, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, for the Forest Service, uh, for wildlife, we are to provide for viable populations of native wildlife species. And a couple ways that we can do that is provide for habitat, but also provide for connectivity to meet their life history needs. So wildlife passage is, a, um, is an important um, aspect of our management there. Sarah, Sid, you guys want to join in? Sure, yeah. So for the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, I'm a wildlife habitat biologist. So I deal with a, a lot of things around education and um, commenting on land use issues. So just trying to keep the public informed and also engage with our partners like Lori and Sydney. And ODFW doesn't own a lot of property. So we rely on our partners that way too, like the Forest Service who has a lot of land and ODOT that manages the, the roads that we need to get animals across. Yeah, and for the Oregon Department of Transportation, we're obviously very concerned with the safety of the traveling public. So anytime um, drivers have the potential to hit large animals like deer and elk, that's obviously a problem that can cause injury or death. So we always are looking for ways to reduce uh, the potential for wildlife vehicle collisions and keep, keep people safe when they're traveling. Nice. Thank you. Thanks for sharing. Well, um, we have a presentation. Sarah, do you want to start us off with that? Sure. I'm going to share my screen. So we're just going to scroll through some information here, starting with this, this first title screen. And I just want to get people thinking about the ways that we have altered the landscape that makes our lives easier, but maybe in some ways makes it more challenging for the wildlife that, that we share the ground with here. And to do that today, we're going to start by mostly talking about this critter, the mule deer. Um, but wildlife passage affects a lot of different animals that may all need to move around in one way or another, but mule deer are really interesting and they're really well known to a lot of people. And one thing that I want to say too about the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife and, and our mandate, our mandate is to, to manage animals for sustainability and to perpetuate them into the future for future generations. But those animals don't belong to our agency. They belong to everybody, the general public. So we're all stewards in one way or another of, of these animals. And that's just an important thing that I hope that you'll keep in the back of your mind as, as we go through this presentation. So as I mentioned, um, mule deer are kind of our, our poster child for this talk. And they, they are found in every Western state to one extent or another. And this map shows their overall range or the, the habitat that they're found in. And we can divide that into summer range in the pink here and winter range. And so they really do cover a lot of, a lot of ground. And I'm sure you've seen them in your yards and, and maybe out in the woods as well. It's a nice picture of, of a buck here. So in, in Oregon, deer are found primarily east of the Cascade Mountains. Mule deer are found east of the Cascade Mountains. And you probably are familiar with a lot of this, a lot of this territory here and Maybe you could think of times that you've seen deer when you've been out and about. We focus in on summer range. Deer here in the summertime, they're, they're really enjoying, like, like a lot of us do, the, the warm temperatures and all of the lush green vegetation. Deer are spending a lot of their time 
eating basically and kind of bulking up for the winter that, that's coming ahead. And this is when the, the does are having their fawns. They, they need a lot of cover for their fawns. They need a lot of nutrition for nursing and for raising the fawns to be strong enough to follow them down the hill when, when the weather turns. So after fall migration, deer find themselves out on winter range and they do this as the snow falls. They wanna escape the deep snow. It's harder for them to find food and move around. So they end up in areas like this, the, the shrub step with a lot of sagebrush and maybe some juniper. Sometimes they're in thicker trees here. I don't know if you can see the deer in this photo, but they, they spend a lot of time just kind of trying to stand still, find places to get out of the wind and the elements. And th there is food around, but it's much more limited. So they're living off those fat reserves they accumulated during the summertime. And it's really important that they, they just do not get disturbed during this time. And, and that's, that's where we often find a lot of conflict between people and deer because they're in this lower country, right? Where a lot of us like to, to live and, and kind of go about our daily lives as well. I think Lori's gonna tell us a little bit about some of the things that she sees in the Forest Service. All right. So as Sarah said, um, winter is a critical time for deer because they need to retain those fat reserves to make it through the winter um, so that they can make it back up to summer range and uh, reproduce and do this cycle all over again. But our deer face many obstacles on both winter and summer range. Um, and this is just due to the sheer number of people that are on the landscape. So I'm gonna give you an example. Um, of uh, use numbers um, for the Deschutes National Forest. So um, we're gonna use some national visitor use monitoring information and this um, is conducted every five years. So in 2013, um, the Deschutes saw 1.7 million visitors that year. When the uh, monitoring was conducted again in 2018, that number jumped to 3.3 million visitors. And um, this year, um, due to COVID um, and all the things that has that has brought, um, we have seen an additional 30% jump in visitor numbers, bringing that number to 4.3 million visitors. So this increased recreation pressure um, and use on our landscape does have an impact to our deer populations. So alongside the increasing human pressure that we find out there, our deer populations are actually declining. And this little graphic here shows our population estimates that the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife has made over the last 20 years. It even goes back further than this. But this dark blue line is the number of deer that we'd like to see out in Central Oregon. And the lighter blue line is what we're actually seeing. And you can tell this number has been going down over the course of time. And in some cases, it's, there's been a 40% decline in the last three years. And there's a lot of things contributing to this. We, we know from a long-term study on mule deer that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes that, that illegal harvest contributes to some of this, um, predation, disease, and a lot of times, along with vehicle collisions, and a lot of times those things intersect. You may have a deer that's scared by an approaching vehicle that gets bumped into a cougar or something like that. And there's, there's a lot of different scenarios that you can, that you can I like do. that. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe vice versa, a deer running away from a cougar that, <laughs> yeah. that's probably a little more logical, but anyway, I think you understand what I'm saying. So uh, anyway, so after tracking this decline in, in deer populations, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife decided to do this long-term study and that's what actually got me involved with the agency in the first place. This was about 10 years ago. And so for seven years, we tracked hundreds of mule deer. Mostly they were females, does, um, throughout Central Oregon. And this little video here that's, that's on a loop shows you the movements of just two of those animals. And this is their winter range here outside of Redmond. And the two of them in the spring, they move to their summer ranges. This one moves all the way south down here to Wikiup Reservoir, and this one moves past sisters up toward the Cascade Crest. So when you're looking at, at these little dots moving around on the, on the landscape, 
it's, it's interesting to think about how closely they follow their migratory paths every year back and forth. They're, they're very, very committed to those migratory routes. And then at the same time, they're, they're crossing all of these really busy roads, but they're not crossing Highway 97. So we, we tend to look at some of these busier highways as actually a barrier that, that deer just avoid, those migratory paths that, that maybe once existed, they, they just kind of blink out. And this is a picture of one of the deer that contributed to our study. Sarah, do you know if those are the same, the two data points there on the map, are they the same species? Yeah, those are both mule deer. Um, they're both adult females that, that we tracked for about a year and a half. And each of those points was recorded about every four hours. Wow. Yeah, so <laughs> fascinating to look at. Yeah. Okay, as Sarah alluded to, highways pose a bit of a barrier uh, to wildlife movement and um, ODOT is concerned about people running into these animals when they're driving on Oregon highways. So we're interested in working with Department of Fish and Wildlife and Forest Service to reduce those wildlife vehicle collisions. And this isn't um, an issue that's unique to Oregon. Uh, states across the West are dealing with this. In Oregon, we have about 7,000 wildlife vehicle collisions per year on ODOT highways. And that's really a conservative number since we know from studies like ODFW has conducted that it's actually two to three times that number since a lot of deer will get struck by, by a car and then wander off the, the highway and die later. And as a result, we have about 700 people each year that are seriously injured and about two fatalities. So it's a very expensive issue. It's expensive for drivers. If you get an accident, there's a large cost associated with repairing your vehicle. There's the cost if you end up in the hospital um, and there's also a cost to the deer. They can also end up injured or dead, and there's a loss of hunting revenue. And it's also expensive for our state since there's a cost uh, to have our maintenance crews go out to remove those animals from the highway. This here is a map um, showing where our maintenance crews do pick up carcasses. So the green areas are where we have lower density, and then it goes to yellow, orange, and red are those really high density areas where a lot of collisions are occurring. I like to show this map because it shows that it's not an east side or a west side issue. It's not an urban or a rural issue, but it's really an issue that all Oregonians should be concerned with. Um, also, what this map doesn't show us is those highway sections that have already become a barrier to movement. So places like I-5, South on 97, um, I-84, where we're having a lot of traffic that are already prohibiting animals from crossing the highway. This is another map just showing which species are collected. And you can see by and large, the vast majority are mule deer that are being struck on highways. Denny, are those color coordinated up there or is it just the icons are different? Uh, yeah, the different species have different colors. It looks like bears, orange. Sorry, I, I, sorry, I shouldn't say that's mule deer because it's not mule deer on the west side, right? Those are those would be other deer. Okay. Sorry, I don't know. What yeah, they're black tail. Yeah, they're a subspecies. Yeah. Okay, I don't know if I need to repeat that. Sorry. You're fine. Okay, so the vast majority of deer are getting struck, struck on highways. So, what is Oregon and ODOT doing to help drivers um, be safe on the highways? Like I said, this isn't an issue that's unique to Oregon. Other states around the West and other countries, including Canada, have been dealing with this problem um, a lot longer than we have. And what, one thing they've come up with are these structures called wildlife crossings that allow animals to cross human-made barriers. So here we can see the highway running at the top of the screen from left to right, and underneath is um, an area where animals are able to move underneath the highway safely. And so this particular structure was built on US 97 as part of a passing lane project and designed for mule deer. Uh, but with the installation of the wildlife fencing for about four miles on each side of the highway to help animals find the undercrossing, we find that really almost over 30 species benefit from these crossing structures. So if you build it, they will come. And after monitoring, we see a large range of, of species that, that do benefit, including our beloved mule deer. I can't <laughs> I'm um, sorry. Mar Marmot? Marmot, yes. <laughs> A cute one. Yeah. Put out. Sorry. <laughs> Raccoons. 
There's a jackrabbit, skunk, bobcat. Everybody's joining in. It's a party. I like it. Yeah, it is a party. So like I say, you, you design it for one animal and all these other creatures benefit as well, including elk. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to, um, you know, bring this up too soon if you're going to talk about this, but don't we in Oregon have one other underpass to have collected data by or that we can look at as an example? I think it, it's a Lava Butte. Yeah, this is the Lava Butte project that we're looking at here. Yeah, we do actually have another project um, between Newport and um, Corvallis, the Piner Mountain to Eddyville project. There is a, there was a large culvert that was put in there for mule deer, for, sorry, for elk um, and deer in that part of the state as well. Yeah. So you can see that these structures work year round when they're, whether they're during their spring or fall migration. And wildlife fecal collisions have been reduced by over 86% as a result of this project. So it's, it's very successful. We know they work, we know what to do uh, to help get animals across the highway. And so because of that, um, when ODOT had a passing lane project um, south of Lava Butte on uh, at the town of Gilcrest, uh, we, ODOT installed another wildlife undercrossing designed for mule deer and elk this time. And this is a photo of that, that recently completed project. Unfortunately, um, the, it was added late in the project, so there wasn't enough money to uh, include the fence as part of the actual construction. So we've been fundraising with our, our, many of our partners, including the Oregon Wildlife Foundation, to get that fence installed, um, hopefully in 2021. We'll have, we also will have um, the link. I'm going to put the link right now in chat for the video. And also we have it down below on the page. So you don't need to play the video right now if you don't want to, but <laughs> we do have it. And it's super um, self-explanatory, but it does give, um, one thing I really like about that video, Sid, is that you get to actually see it. I know it's it's so much different to see it in video than it is on the photos of it because you get to see Absolutely. the of it um, and see that wildlife really can go underneath. and. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, is this me? Sorry. Well, we're kind of wrapping up. So these are some <laughs> things it sounds like that we can do for larger projects that agencies can do together in collaboration. Like a lot of us are, you know, Oregon Wildlife Foundation are together with ODOT and, um, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Lori, do you want to touch on a couple things on an individual level that we might be able to do to, to prevent or to help, I guess, help sustain the paths that wildlife have to take? Sure. So as we work to restore our landscapes and um, connectivity, we need to think about how our efforts are influencing um, disturbance to wildlife species. And perhaps maybe this isn't a, um, we need to address this as an objective in our restoration efforts, big and small, whether that's um, a crossing structure or um, something that you can do in your backyard. So a few things um, that anybody can do um, are give wildlife space, um, observe uh, wildlife from a distance, uh, especially during those critical times because um, if you cause them to flee or, um, you know, you could have consequences to that, as Sarah alluded to earlier. Um, don't feed wildlife. Um, they're especially adapted to survive in their natural habitats. And so, um, so we don't need to help them out necessarily. <laughs> um, obey seasonal restrictions. Um, Many of these are put in place uh, during critical times of the year, um, you know, like winter um, to allow them to get through that period or during the reproductive season to allow the fawns or calves um, to mature. Do you, are you talking about restrictions of human use in recreation areas? Like you can't go over here during this time of year? Yeah, many times there's seasonal restrictions um, for trails or um, area closures, something right. like that. And so, um, and those are usually posted um, for people to follow. So gotcha. um, you could slow down. Um, it's easier to react to wildlife entering the highway um, if you're not traveling at high speeds and you're gonna avoid that accident and 
avoid um, injuring or killing the wildlife species. So it's a benefit to everybody. Um, you can stay on trails. Um, don't create your own uh, because this just leads to further fragmentation and increased disturbance. And um, we already have a lot of that out there already. So um, also another thing you can do is um, use wildlife friendly fencing. Um, whether you want wildlife to be excluded from your area or you want them to pass through, there's different types of fencing. And um, so um, consider that as something that you could do. And then educate your friends. Um, tell them about this too, because not everybody realizes what, what they're doing out there. And um, if we all work together, we can make it a better place for um, wildlife and humans together. So these are just a few things that you can do to have a big impact um, on our landscape. Yeah, a lot of those, I feel like you think of, I mean, for me, I think it's one of us growing up in Pacific Northwest, not feeding wildlife, not feeding deer. That seems like more common sense, but other things that you mentioned, like staying on the trail, I know I see it posted a lot, but you're still, when you're out, sometimes it seems like, well, that's a natural path I could take, or it seems like there's a clearing over here. Maybe I can find my own adventure, that kind of thing. But I can absolutely see where the disturbance comes into play here. Yeah. And you may only see your, you know, a couple people out there when you're traveling on a trail. But um, as we found out, there's, you know, it, it's maybe a constant stream of people. And so um, you're just maybe one of 500 people in that day um, right. traveling on a trail. So yeah, um, not that special. Yep. Right. <laughs> And, um, and animals actually, um, predictability matters. So um, if the animals understand where that trail is and it's a predictable pattern, um, it's a lot easier for them to uh, deal with that than if you're off trail and, um, you know, kind of bushwhacking it through there. Yeah. Um, it causes <laughs> additional issues for them. Wow, great stuff, cool. Um, well, thank you for sharing those um, those different pointers, those tips. We actually have time, it looks like, for a couple Q&As, if you guys are willing to do that. I had a few people write in on Facebook and email last week. So if you want, I could dive into those. Yeah. Was sure. <laughs> okay, so question number one here I have is, how much does hunting affect deer populations? And um, also how... How does it affect your populations compared to other causes of fatalities? Okay, yeah, I, I can take that one. So we structure our seasons, um, the majority of our seasons are buck only harvest. So to our calculations, that, that shouldn't be contributing to population decline at all. The, the, a, a buck can, can father many, many fawns uh, among the does. And we, we leave enough bucks to do that. <laughs> and if we're not taking does, then, then we're not compromising the population. So th that's not the issue really, but, but illegal harvest is a concern. And a, a lot of the illegal harvest that we observed on that study that I mentioned were, were does that people were killing outside of the season, outside of, of what we are monitoring for. And that, that was about 20% of our mortality that we saw. Wow. So that, that was definitely a concern and a surprise, yeah. Um, do you have do you have any numbers about your over year for that, or what the growth of that number has been in the last five years? Anything like that has it grown ex exponentially? The illegal harvest. Yeah, um, it it was actually kind of just a snapshot over the course of the whole study. Um, I don't have the numbers year to year, and and we're not tracking that many deer anymore, so it's it's kind of hard to say. It's it's really hard to in a lot of cases we you know, fifty percent of our deer mortalities was unknown cause. And we think a portion of that was illegal harvest too. So it's, it's kind of hard to, to narrow into a really hard number, but it's, it's at least one in five deer are dying by illegal harvest. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Second question I have here. I see a lot of animal crossing signs along the highway near my house. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, does ODOT install the signs because it's known as an exact spot where deer cross or is it just the general vicinity? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, we, our traffic engineers have a, an algorithm that they use to determine where they put those signs, and typically it's based on where they're picking up um, a higher number of carcasses. So they try and limit those signs since we know they're not very effective. 
but they do have a, there is a rhyme and reason to where those are placed. Gotcha. Okay. And lastly, I think we'll just do this one last question I have is what happens to a fawn when a doe is killed? Can they survive on their own? I can take that. Um, if it's, if it's early in the fawn's life, and most fawns are born in June, maybe early July, they might have a really hard time getting by. They, they most likely would fall prey to a coyote or a cougar. In some cases, fawns are adopted by other does. I don't know how often that happens, but I have seen does running around out there with you know maybe three fawns, which is pretty unusual for a doe. That's so over. sweet. It I is, like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, if, if it's later in the season, you know, like late fall, and the fawns are already weaned and eating regular food, then they can probably get by, you know, group up with other deer and, and get by. But it's definitely not ideal for them to, to lose their mom in their first year of life. So, Gotcha. Let's see on time. Well, I think we're running out of time. I know that there's um, some unanswered questions and we have some more too that were write-ins, but maybe we can all get together another time and do either a quick Q&A follow-up or maybe I can have you on in another six months or we can talk about seasonal migration. I know there's so much more to expand on here. It's such a complex topic. So um, maybe if you guys are all okay with it, we can meet again and do this and go, go in deeper with detail. Absolutely. <laughs> Sounds good. Well, we're going to transition here to talk with uh, Suzanne Linford, but is there anything quickly that you, any of you wanna plug any projects Twitter accounts, any upcoming projects you want to talk about, anything like that? Well, there's the license plate. Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> I have this ready. Yeah, we have our Watch for Wildlife license plate. I'm going to drop the link here in the comments section. Um, but this is a this is a project, collaborative project, of course. Um, that the funds for the license plate here that we sell, we're about halfway right now. We need to reach three thousand. Um, license plate vouchers sold before we can put the plate into production. The funds from the plate will go to um, animal migration, habitat, safe connectivity for um, for the passage for not just the deer, but wildlife that we were talking about earlier as well. So very excited for that project here with us. Anybody else have any anything, any ways that we can communicate with you after where you guys like to update on projects? No, <laughs> that's okay. I, I, know that part. I know, um, I know the Forest Service, and I know that um, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, actually in ODOT too. I know that the two departments, U.S. Forest Service and Fish and Wildlife, have um, conservation-focused uh, online social media accounts, Twitter accounts, and of course ODOT has a lot of updates too going on, especially with um, Gilcrest. Like I said, the mm -hmm have of Sydney there on the project site is really great because you can see the scale and the stature of the project. So it's pretty cool. So thank you all for your time. Um, thank you for your point of view and your expertise. So now we're going to introduce Protect Animal Migration's founder and policy advocate, Suzanne Linford. Suzanne Linford is the founder of the group PAM, Protect Animal Migration, and has helped facilitate the collaboration of Lori, Sydney, and Sarah and their state departments with the focused goal to protect wildlife as they move within their natural corridors. So Suzanne, thank you for being here. And I was wondering if you'd like to start off by describing why you created PAM. Well, thank you. Well, like many things, it was uh, the unintended consequences of my deciding to attend a all-day conference in Bend, where I live, called, Frankly, Mule Deer, We Do Give a Damn. <laughs> it was that title that intrigued me. I wasn't real sure what mule deer were, <laughs> um, but I was an interpreter at the High Desert Museum and uh, where I gave talks on um, wildlife and the social history of Central Oregon. So at this uh, conference, I learned that mule deer are in peril, uh, particularly here in a natural migratory corridor. And Fish and Wildlife asked the public to become involved 
in stopping the very high rate of animal vehicle collisions. There were several meetings and I went to one in which the leader resigned at the meeting. <laughs> And they went around the table and everyone said why they couldn't be involved, but they were there just because they were curious. <clears throat> and when they said, uh, well, perhaps we should just meet again and talk about how we could help wildlife. And I said, no, let's just do something. And that's how I decided <laughs> to become <laughs> involved in starting a nonprofit. And I had no experience in nonprofits. And how long, how long have you been doing this now? Uh, almost five years. Okay. And uh, we are an educational nonprofit. We work in collaboration, as you said, with the public agencies and now in partnership with the Oregon Wildlife Foundation. And we differ in our outreach and our education um, from other conservation uh, outreach in a few ways. And one is we attempt to reach the general public, and this is often the public that doesn't really relate to being a conservationist, but who do care about wildlife. And we also combine fact-based science with the relational connection that people have with wildlife. And that can vary greatly. Uh, with uh, mountain bicyclists, it's trails, and it's the impact of trails. And it's the reason they're asked not to ride on certain trails when elk are calving. And what we also do is we ask people to help solve the problem. And we say to them, you are uniquely suited to help come up with solutions that will give wildlife a better chance of sharing our habitat. So you speak to, on an individual level than to people? <clears throat> well, uh, we're speaking to groups. Mm -hmm. But what I do is, and again, using the skills of interpretation, we'll find out what a group is about. Uh, <clears throat> for example, we just spoke to a group that's very well established in land stewardship. So we didn't start off on a level that we would with a group that uh, didn't have that commitment already. Can you give me an example of legislature that you've helped pass or advocate for in connection with animal safety? Yes, the last two bills that were passed last year, one creating um, the Recreation and Conservation Fund and also one uh, requiring that ODOT and Fish and Wildlife work together and connectivity. I was very active in that. Uh, we have postcards with uh, an adorable looking deer, mule deer on it. And we collected signatures at various fairs and tabling events we went to. There were signatures from people who lived mostly in Central Oregon, but also elsewhere in Oregon. And the message was generic. It said, please support wildlife legislation. And at different stages, as these bills were making their way through different committees, I would send these postcards to the committee members and sometimes they'd get 10 and 50. I had 240 postcards. <laughs> and I would send, and then I would send an email to each member of the committee linking the interests in wildlife in their constituency whether it was tourism or whether it was education and refer it to their area. And for example, say as a coastal community, 
you, like Central Oregon, Eastern Oregon, rely on tourism, and the tourists often come over to this side of the Cascades mm -hmm. <laughs> to see wildlife, and they want to see wildlife that's alive. They don't want to see yeah. it. <laughs> they don't want to see it on the road. So yeah. that's, that's an example of what I did last year. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Still trying to make it, um, I will ask myself, well, if I were a representative from uh, South, uh, Southern Oregon or Eastern Oregon, <clears throat> what would my relationship with wildlife be that would give me motivation to support the legislation? So, and that requires, that requires some research on my part. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of, a lot of a legwork that you're doing too, sending postcards, you know, sending those individual emails, finding information for the right groups and the right people and making sure that they're, that the legislature hears what needs to be heard so that they understand how important it is. It is very labor intensive. It's yeah. full, it's full time uh, when a bill is going through. And uh, of course, asking them to be, uh, to meet with them is also another ask uh, that often when they've been given all the information, they don't feel they need to <laughs> meet. Uh, two of our local legislators um, each got, and one of our commissioners, who, is a de who was a developer, he's no longer on our commission, uh, uh, each got 25 postcards. <laughs> So we have what I call an outsized presence. <laughs> Sometimes I feel like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> I mean, a little bit. And you also brought in, you brought Lori and Sarah and Sydney together in this group, right? Well, Sydney popped up at our first meeting. She was very proactive. Um, and then... <clears throat> Uh, Fish and Wildlife, I was, I was talking to uh, Sarah's boss, and then he, uh, he appointed Sarah to be the one to work with me. And then finally, Lori came in. And it, it took them probably a couple of years, I think, to finally trust me. Because I have no other agenda. I'm a volunteer. Right. I'm not associated with any organization that is, has been adversarial. And my policy is not to be adversarial at all and not to be critical. And in that way, because you're not tied to any, anything else or anyone else, it really seems to give you that freedom to be able to yes. start or show up in meetings and, you know, speak freely to, to legislature. Right. I'm able to do things that public employees can't do. Yeah. Uh, and that is to advocate and, and be more proactive in those ways. So I always know, though, that it's a real privilege that ODOT, Fish and Wildlife, and the Forest Service allows us to have their logos on their, our printed information and that that's a trust and that were I to act in any way that would violate their trust, I, I would not have their support. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, I know that there's so much more that we can talk about here, even about the group PAM, but um, how can people support PAM? Well, they can make a donation to the Oregon Wildlife Foundation and say, this is for Pam, we're, we're supporting educational outreach and programs. Even a $10 donation would be a, a big help as we are expanding our virtual platform. They could also buy a, um, a voucher for a Watch Out for Wildlife a license plate this again is from the Oregon Wildlife Foundation and the money goes toward the educational programs and the other programs that are the work of this foundation. 
Yeah, we um, we have our donation form just down below on the page. So if people wanted to make a donation for Pam, they could in our donation page below. They can also attend meetings when zoning of winter range uh, is being discussed and bring to that meeting the question of what about wildlife? How does this developing uh, development, proposed development impact wildlife? And all in all <clears throat> ask that wildlife be uh, present at the table as a major stakeholder. And that's one of the most important things they can do. How can they, how can they find meetings like that that they should attend? Can they watch your Facebook page or Twitter, anything like that? They, the best way is to go on the, for us, we're in Deschutes County. Yeah. They could go on the county website and see all the different sign up for community planning and for, uh, for any other committees or information that would, seems to relate to land use and ask to be on the newsletter list and they check the box and they'll automatically be notified of these meetings. Yes, awesome, I love it. Well, um, as Suzanne said, the license plate that we have uh, is Watch for Wildlife. Our, let's see, <laughs> get this in frame here. Our license plate campaign explicitly addresses this issue, as I mentioned earlier. The plate proceeds are dedicated to projects that provide safe passage to wildlife of all kinds. The highway underpass that Sydney spoke on earlier is actually an example of that, the Gilcrest underpass. So um, our foundation, Oregon Wildlife Foundation, is a nonprofit and this plate is our own. So although state departments like Oregon Transportation partners with us um, on, on conservation projects, a lot of other state departments like Fish and Wildlife, they do not receive Watch for Wildlife plate money, but we do, this is our plate. So, um, so we created a fund to be sure that the dollars from the plate are sourced to directly help wildlife. Um, I'm gonna put the link in the chat now, um, in the chat window to I think the right of our screen here where you can learn more about how specialty plates in Oregon get approved and how you can reserve your plate today. And it's really cute, I like it. It's got a, a white-tailed deer on it and it has a picture of Mount Hood on it as well. So very Oregon, <laughs> that's what I got. Um, you can also, like I said, donate in our forum below. I'm putting our social media in chat right now. And also, if you wanted to catch Protect Animal Migration on Facebook, they are at Pam Central Oregon. And I know that you guys have a lot of really great information. And you're, you post your blog posts on there as well. So it's a lot of really good wildlife safety tips, safe passage, um, everything that you're all about. So thank you again for joining me. Well, here thank you, family. Sarah. Yeah, thanks for all your help.